Hi students, welcome to Year 11 Biology and Module 4, Ecosystem Dynamics. This is video number 13. We're going to have another look at some very important Australian natives, but this time we're going to focus on the sclerophyll plants. Our learning intention is the same as the large one that we just recently looked at for the uh, Australian small mammals. Uh, but we're going to do exactly the same sort of things to try and look at how we can interpret information from secondary sources to evaluate processes, claims, conclusions relating to the evolution of organisms in Australia. And this time, the focus is on the sclerophyll plants. So again, for those of you who are trying to look at pitching yourself at a various level, you must be able to describe some of the changes in sclerophyll plant populations. And obviously, you need to be able to define what sclerophyll plants are. You may be able to uh, draw some conclusions about changes in populations over time and perhaps even to discuss some of the evolutionary pressures that have contributed to some of the significant adaptations we see in Australian native plant species. So what are sclerophyll plants? Well, sclerophyll literally means hard leaf. And one of the things that you notice about a lot of the Australian native plants is that they, the leaves are not like lettuce. They're not soft. Um, they're very hard and crunchy, and they have, uh, they're filled with all sorts of different toxins in them, particularly the oils that uh, we know so well from the classic eucalypts. A part of the reason that they are like this is because this has enabled them to be very well suited to dry climates. We've talked about before the fact that as Australia drifted north away from the Gondwanan supercontinent, it um, broke its last contact with Antarctica, and as it moved further and further north, uh, it became drier. Um, and as a result of that, a lot of the adaptations that we see in a lot of the native species are associated with drying drought conditions, um, that reduction in the amount of rainfall and warmer conditions generally. We also see some very specific adaptations, especially amongst the eucalypts, to um, the inclusion of toxins or toxic chemicals that can discourage herbivores. So something that's specifically designed to help protect the plant from being eaten uh, by a range of different types of herbivores. Two of the species that we would probably most associate with sclerophyll, and these are the plants that dominate our uh, wet and dry forests, are the eucalypts or the gum trees, um, very famous in Australia, and also the wattles or the acacias. Uh, these two species dominate not just in terms of pure numbers and also uh, the numbers of different species within each of these genera, but also the range of um, distribution that they have around the country. They are very ubiquitous in this country. And um, as a result, we see an enormous amount of the land that's covered with these, these native plants. Of course, we have cleared the number of the forests for a lot of agriculture. So in fact, we don't see quite the same distribution that we did. Um, but nonetheless, these are the two most well-represented components of our native plant species. So we're talking again at trying to piece together some of the changes that were occurring over the last 35 to 50 million years ago. So coming through that um, Eocene, Oligocene period uh, where Australia was isolated, a lot of the um, biota was developing in isolation in an island continent that wasn't being visited by uh, other plants and animals, not on a regular basis. We do know because of some of the ways that plants can be distributed, that there may well have been sort of island colonization, but we really do see a very large number of the two critical families, the Myrtacea and the Proteacea, and we'll look at those in a little bit of detail, um, developing and diversifying uh, over this time frame, to the point where we have over 800 species of each of the eucalypts and acacias. So they're well worth looking at in terms of some of the specific adaptations that have helped them to be so successful in the Australian continent. The Greening of Gondwana by Mary White is a fantastic book. It's a little old now, I guess. So am I, so that's okay. Um, and it has absolute uh, gold in there for looking at uh, developing your understanding of the uh, colonisation of Australia and particularly the diversifying of Australia in the basis of its um, flora. 
One of her quotes from this book is, apart from the two main dominant, they're the two that I've talked at, the eucalypts and acacias, 80% of all the plant species and 30% of the genera occurring in Australia today are endemic, occur here, are local species to the Australian continent. And this is uh, a testament to the isolation of Australia and the fact that it has um, developed in concert with changing climate, with human habitation, with fire, with a whole range of different environmental pressures that have had an influence on this very spectacular and unique flora. So what are we really talking about? Well, we're talking about the two dominant um, families that we see in Australia. Now the Proteasia, uh, obviously not only found in Australia, We've got a number of quite uh, interesting species. So we've got the Waratah, for example, um, which is the state emblem for here in New South Wales. Uh, we've got Banksias, which are very, very common as well, and also Grevillea. And these are three very, um, I guess, well-known. Hakea is probably another representative of the Proteasia group um, that are quite common on the Australian continent. But you see lots and lots of the representatives of each of these um, around. On the other hand, probably the, the two groups that I already talked about as being the most dominant are the eucalypts and the acacia. I do have um, a, an image of a wattle coming up, so and I'm sure you're familiar with those. Um, but these ones here, the bottle brush, uh, the river red gum and the malaluca or paper bark. Uh, again, some really nice uh, representatives of this very important myrtle group, the Myrtacea. Uh, you can see some slight differences uh, in the leaves. So the classic gum leaves, they come from the Myrtacea family. The eucalypts are highly uh, diverse group uh, that uh, exist within the Myrtacea family. Um, and a lot of the interesting thing about the eucalypts is to actually look at the trunks, look at the bark. That is one of the ways that we use identifiers of different types of species or different representatives from within the eucalypt group is just how different these different types of bark are on so many of these different plants. This is obviously a very simplified overview of representatives of families that have hundreds of species. Uh, but it gives you a little bit of an idea of these two main types of uh, plant groups uh, that dominate the forests of Australia. But this is about ways in which the plants have evolved or changed over time and what information we can see and what we can conclude from this as well. And so one of the important things that we want to talk about when we're talking about uh, evolution, we're talking about change or we're trying to find adaptations that specifically link to the certain individuals or groups or populations that we are studying. Uh, and one of the ways that's really important when we're looking at any species is to look at its reproductive strategies because the reproductive strategies are really how the genetic information gets from one generation into the next. No species can live forever, although trees, um, certainly some trees have very, very long lives, but they can't live forever. So they have to be able to continue to move their genetic information into future generations. And with plants, this is about pollination, uh, this is about dispersal of the gametes, but it's also about dispersal of the seed. So once the sperm meets the egg and you get the seed developing from that seed, we're going to produce a new plant. And as a result of that, where those uh, plants grow, because they can't physically get up and walk somewhere, how those seeds are dispersed and where they're going to um, start to grow from is, is critically important. And we see a lot of different types of seed dispersal strategies amongst a lot of native Australian uh, flora. So the, one of the easiest ones is through uh, wind dispersal. So the parachute of the mountain devil is one uh, way in which plants, seeds can be dispersed. They can be very light and they can be carried by the wind, which will then drop them perhaps kilometers away from where the parent individuals were. And they can roll. Uh, you may have uh, sampled macadamia nuts. They are a, a delicacy. Uh, but they're also a very good strategy for seed dispersal because the seeds are round and they will roll. And so that's a good way of moving them away from the plant. Remember, one of the things we, we don't want the parents, uh, individuals, is to be competing for the same resources, the same water, the same nutrient, soil nutrients, the same light um, as their offspring. So it would be nice if they were a little bit further away. Um, 
Coconuts float on water, and coconuts are a species that have colonised islands because of this ability for them to float and to resist that um, very salty environment of the sea. Animals can also transport seeds uh, by eating the fruits. The soft fruits are very uh, sweet, and so therefore very palatable to lots of animals, including us. And, uh, and if animals eat the seeds, and the seeds pass through the digestive systems, they will eventually come out some point, usually a distance from where the original uh, fruit was. And again, this is a nice way of being able to seed a new plant, pet with a little bit of its own built-in fertilizer. I'm sure you've been walking around the Australian bush, you've ended up with little burrs or little um, seeds that have been stuck in your clothing. Uh, this is another good strategy that plants can use to disperse their seeds. The fur of a lot of mammals can get these little burrs stuck in them and then they move and then maybe they'll scratch them or they'll brush them off onto, uh, onto the ground somewhere else. And again, it's another way for dispersal to occur. And one thing that we do want to just quickly touch on before we close this um, video is the importance of fire. Fire does seem to have um, built a hand-in-hand um, -hand relationship with a number of different species of plants, both in terms of the strategies that we see to recover from fire, but also the need for fire in order to um, do things like seed dispersal. So you see in the banksia here, the seeds are enclosed in a resin sealed capsule. So these little capsules are actually sealed with resin and the resin is um, requires a high temperature to melt and then for those seed cases to pop open and to throw out the seeds. So fire is actually required in each of these situations in order for the seeds to be released. Two other adaptations which are really great ones to talk about and specifically relate to eucalypts are epicormic buds or epicormic shoots they are sometimes called and lignotubers. Now these are two very important fire adaptations. So we, we're aware, you've, if, again, if you've been walking or driving around uh, anywhere where there is bush, you'll notice um, blackened trunks from fires that have passed through, either recent ones or ones from some time ago. If you've looked at one that's actually had a fire through it a little while back, say a year or more, then you can often find these epicormic buds, these little regions uh, where the plant has um, a bud sitting underneath the bark. And so when the plant's under stress, as it obviously is when a fire passes through, that triggers a hormonal response, which means that the bud will start to um, grow basically and so you see on the blackened trunks these new little shoots that are starting to appear and that's a common feature of areas of the Australian bush that have been burnt. Now if the if the new growth doesn't start from underneath the bark in, in one of these epicormic buds it might come from the ground from so now you need to look at the the base of the trunk rather than along the surface of the trunk. You now need to look at the base of the trunk. Underground, you'll find these lignotubers. So again, basically regions underneath the plant that uh, underneath the ground right next to the plant where the plant will be able to send up new shoots. Again, it will do this uh, as fire has gone through and it'll give the plant this opportunity to start to um, take advantage of the um, opportunities that have opened up as the result of fire that's going to open the canopy. It's going to uh, remove a lot of the growth that was already there. So the plants are going to need to be able to try and take advantage uh, of these conditions as quickly as possible, set themselves uh, to grow very quickly and to recover from these periods of fire. This sort of relationship between fire and growth or new growth or re-establishment of uh, previous individuals uh, are great ways of identifying or tying in some of the ways in which we see change in populations, we see change in um, species, we see biodiversity created alongside these environmental pressures or selecting pressures that have impacted upon individuals. Thanks for watching.